I would like to now call on His Worship, Mayor Tom Good, for the official welcome. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, honored guest, members of Parliament, Mr. Leon Ladner, and his former campaign manager, Mr. Howard Green, Honorable Howard Green, Delta senior citizens, and fellow liberals. <laughs> when it was mentioned tonight that John thought he was taking offense to me by saying that John Reynolds should be the member of parliament for many years, I said to my wife, I have no objection whatsoever to John Reynolds being a member of parliament as long as he does not run for mayor of Delta. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it falls upon me the honor this evening to welcome to Delta a great Canadian. But I don't think that any words that I could say here tonight would match the love and respect that the right honorable member received today by the citizens of Delta. Wherever you went with the right honorable member, old, young families stood in line to talk to him for a moment, to say a few words about relatives back in Saskatchewan. And I don't know what makes a great Canadian, but I do know this, that the man sitting next to me has whatever it takes. However, he is a conservative, <laughs> and I must take exception to one of the recent remarks that he made in Vancouver. Speaking to the Canadian Club, he mentioned that he was the only living prime, former Prime Minister of Canada. However, he went on to add to those gathered there that he felt he was soon to be joined by one other. <laughs> I think the only difference of opinion we might have is the time in which that person joins the ranks. <laughs> Sir, it is a privilege for me as the mayor of Delta, not only have, having to serve with you for four and a half years in the House of Commons, but to welcome you on behalf of the citizens of Delta to our community. Thank you very much. I'd like to now call on a member of parliament, Mr. John Reynolds, to introduce some special guests. Please, John. Thank you, John. You can be assured, Tom, I'm not going to run for mayor, <laughs> at least for a couple of more elections. <laughs> it's my pleasure tonight to introduce a few people in the audience. And when I look around, there's so many we could introduce, but we just don't have the time. But there's some people here that I would like everybody to meet. The first man is a man who's helped us in organizing this dinner, worked entirely helping us do it. He's a man who's been one of Mr. Diefenbaker's friends for many, many years, Mr. Lyle Jesley of Vancouver. Lyle, please stand up and take a bow. The next man is a man who Mr. Diefenbaker spoke about last night in White Rock. And certainly, and I'd heard about him a lot of times before in Ottawa when I've had the pleasure of sitting in Mr. Diefenbaker's office. This man was Mr. Diefenbaker's campaign manager in Prince Albert. And he tells us that he wouldn't have been prime minister if it hadn't been for this man. So we owe him a great deal of gratitude. Fred Hadley, who is now living in White Rock, would you please stand up and take a bow? We have a man sitting in the audience who is a member of Parliament for Burrard and Mr. Diefenbaker's administration, John Taylor. Would you please take a bow? <laughs> and lastly, we've got a man in the audience who tells me he still shoots his golf score at the same age he is. He's a member of Hockey's Hall of Fame. He was a citizen of the year in Vancouver in 1966. He played on the last Stanley Cup hockey winner in Vancouver. 
That's a long time ago. Mr. Cyclone Taylor, please take a bow. And now I'd like to call on my colleague in Ottawa, Mr. Ben O'Friesen, to introduce our honored guest. Mr. Chairman, members of the head table, and friends, I feel uh, doubly privileged tonight to uh, have this honor because this is the second night in a row that I have the privilege of introducing our guest of honor. I first heard the name of John Deaton Baker in Rostron, Saskatchewan as a young boy when the men after the noon dinner on Sunday used to gather in the parlor. In those days there were no such things as living rooms or dens, there were always parlors. And the men used to gather there and and discuss politics in low German in our household. And they used to speak in some somewhat rather hushed tones, the name of John Diefenbaker. And then in uh, 20 or 30 years later, I was attending Northwestern University in Chicago, and it was pretty hard to get news from Canada in those days. And I did hear of the election in 1958 and the Diefenbaker sweep, and the Americans couldn't even pronounce the name much less understand the man. And then, last night, we had the privilege of having Mr. Deaton Baker in White Rock, and I saw again the degree to which he has won the hearts of Canadians of all ages. And some wonder why he has been able to do this or how he has been able to do this. And I suppose the easiest way to say it is because of his wit and his wisdom. And it's impossible to hear Mr. Diefenbaker speak without hearing his wit. Just the day before yesterday, I was traveling on a bus with uh, Senator Eugene Forsey. We were going to a reception, and he regaled me all the way with stories that Mr. Diefenbaker had told him, and uh, I just have to share one. He was telling about the time that one of our colleagues in the House of Commons should have been making a statement about a crisis that the government was facing. And Mr. Diefenbaker naturally was very perturbed that the Liberals were not being harangued by the opposition at this time. And he said, imagine, he should be making a statement. And what's he doing? He's taking a two-week French immersion course. <laughs> and then he, then he leaned back, and with a gleam in his eye, he said, now, we Baptists know all about immersion. <laughs> but we have the good sense of coming up long before two weeks. <laughs> but even more than his wit, it is his wisdom that has won the hearts of Canadian people. The kind of wisdom that uh, avoids the smart aleckay and the smart kind of... Uh, wisdom that we uh, are sometimes attracted to. He had the wisdom, most of all, to stay with the people and to avoid the pitfall of electronics and the magic that electronics holds for some people. And when I think of Mr. Diefenbaker, we could pile on and multiply the superlatives. But when we reduce it to the most necessary essentials, we must say, he is a man. Take him for all in all, we shall not see the lake again. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you our friend, companion of honor, our former prime minister, the right honorable John George Stephen Baker. busy life. The last couple of days have been no exception. Every hour on the hour, I've had to make a speech. <laughs> and there is nothing more difficult for those like myself, unaccustomed in so doing. <laughs> and, I, 
In all seriousness, I've had a very happy time beyond words to express uh, what it has meant to me as the heart of your people here, Mr. Mayor, has been poured out to me. I'm sometimes told there are no rewards in politics. I've seen the heights. I've seen the depths. But if I had my life to live over again, and I'm just start on the second section, <laughs> I would follow the course that I have. And it didn't come easy in the city of Moncton when those who preceded me were virtually howled down. It was in 1965. And sitting up in front of me, below the platform, was a lady who was the head of the Truth Squad an organization set up for the purpose of assuring that any deviation by me from the truth uh, would be punished by publicity. <laughs> well, I, see, I got silence when I got up to speak. I reminded them of the, what took place only a few weeks before Sir John MacDonald died in the campaign of 1891, and he was speaking in Smith Falls, ill, facing death, still indomitable. It was a noisy meeting for those who preceded him. And when he rose to speak, Suddenly, he was given assistance by a great big Irish Canadian of the Ottawa Valley variety, than which there is no witcher. <laughs> and uh, he said, let's have order here. Let us not have disagreeable occurrences such as have, have taken place here this evening. Let us hear what he has to say tall man with an imposing stature, a sonorous voice, and the appearance of authority. Silence came over the meeting. And Sir John said, I just want to thank you, my friend, for bringing about such unusually good order. In the back there came that loud voice. He said, Sir John, don't think I'm going to support you. I wouldn't vote for you if you were the angel Gabriel. <laughs> Sir John said, you're right again. You wouldn't be in my constituency. <laughs> well, now then. Well, at this meeting in Moncton, one of the outstanding interrupters had a high-pitched falsetto voice. He could be heard above everyone. And as I got up to speak, when I finally got silence, he said, give him hell, John, just in a contemptuous way. I said, my friend, I don't do that. I just tell the truth, and it sounds like that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a wonderful occasion. I, I'm deeply grateful to Tom Good for his very generous words. Former colleague in the House of Commons, he and his father before him. I was very deeply touched this afternoon and again this evening by your presence. It means a great deal in the building of that spirit in Canada which is necessary above all things that while we may dis disagree in regard to the means whereby this, the greatness of our future will be assured. At the same time, never forget the fact that those who do not disagree with you 
are good Canadians, are to be treated as such. The essence of democracy is the right to disagree. And I, as an aside, may I say it's very happy that I had as my friend to introduce me, Benno Friesen. It's wonderful to bring with one one's own introducer. <laughs> You're assured of an objectivity uh, that could not otherwise be attained. And when coupled there with my friend John Reynolds, you have had the full story in truth and in fact. <laughs> the only regret I have this evening is that my wife isn't with me. And at the expense of referring to something I've already referred to, Olive has been with me in victory and in defeat. And uh, we have quite a system. She's a major advisor. And I'm a major acceptor <laughs> of her advice. And that brings about a state of equanimity that can't be gained under any other circumstances. And uh, as I said on a previous occasion, we have grace in our home. And I usually say it. And about a year ago, I said to her one morning, Olive, would you say grace this morning? She bowed her head. She raised her head. I said, I didn't hear what you were saying. She said, I wasn't speaking to you. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, All I can tell you is this, as I was about to say a moment ago, that the rewards of public life cannot be estimated in monetary gain, but there is no satisfaction to equal that of one's fellow Canadians, many of whom disagreed with the views that I expressed in past years and today in the light of events no longer take that position. And that's the essence of leadership. Not being popular, but leading. And of course the outstanding example of that, without whose magnificent and indomitable will you and I would not be here tonight. Winston Churchill, through the years passing through the valley of humiliation, if I might borrow an expression from a former Prime Minister of Canada, Mr. King, Churchill went through that. I saw him in the dark days of 1916 came to the gallery of the House of Commons, he who had accepted and administered the greatest state positions was in disgrace over Gallipoli. History has proven it. It wasn't his responsibility. It was not properly carried out, or he would have achieved immortality then. I saw him again in 1936 when he endeavored to mobilize the king's men behind Edward VIII, so Mrs. Simpson. The House of Commons jeered him, ridiculed him, held him up to contempt. I saw him again from the gallery of the House of Commons in 1938 when he was the voice of freedom unlistened to, warning of the tremendous danger to freedom that Hitler, by his conduct, would bring about sooner or later. I met him first, two or three days after the fall of, Gallip uh, after the fall of Singapore and the sinking of the Pacific Fleet. 
one of four or five Canadian members of Parliament. And I said to him, Prime Minister, the first time I saw you, you were in disgrace. And he said, will you say that again? I did. He said, which time was that? <laughs> spirit, an unfathomable spirit, the capacity to elevate people, recognition of the great things of life, of the unchangeability of freedom, a voice in the wilderness for so long. And he had that unusual capacity, the ability to, to turn to humor, devastating the power of language. I recall on one occasion him saying this about the ups and downs of politics. He said, when the war ended in Europe, the king offered me the Order of the Garter. He didn't call it that. He said he offered me the Garter. I turned it down. Three months later, the people gave me the boot. <laughs> An inimitable power of language and the ability to take those ups and downs which necessarily follow all of us who participate in public life. And I'll tell you one more thing to illustrate what he's like. I was out there on one occasion, a very few months before he died. He had with him his dog and his cat. And away he goes and shows me the pool that he made and the wall for which he had such unusual expertness that he became a member of the union, the builder's union. There were various birds on the pool, and he called one by one name and another. And then there was a frightful looking monstrosity. He said, come here, Adolf. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, you like animals? Oh, yes. What animals do you like best? He said, I like dogs. They're so faithful. They give one an experience that those in public life do not always have that loyalty and devotion. He said, do you like cats? And I said, I don't. He said, I do. Why do you like cats? He said, because, because there are various reasons, uh, but because they're independent. Any other animals you like, Sir Winston? He said, I like hogs. That'll be something here, Mr. President, in this agricultural area. I like hogs. I said, why? They treat you as equals. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. it was not popular for Churchill to warn. It never is. All of us like that feeling that all is well. My only prayer is this, that all is well, though deeply concerned. And with that aside, I want to say, here at this meeting, you mentioned, Mr. President, it's a very large meeting. You use punctilious language in describing the numbers. I remember a certain famous politician who had the largest meeting he'd ever addressed. He was a man who had an unusual capacity with words. He said, ladies and gentlemen, this is the densest audience that I have ever spoken to. They, that was Adlai Stevenson the man who could play with words. Far over there in the outside came a voice. We ain't all dense. I do not belong to your party. 
one of the most effective <laughs> answers that I've ever heard <laughs> anywhere. And uh, what has particularly pleased me here, and I've been overwhelmed with kindnesses, the numbers of people who have come to me holding no position today whatsoever not apologizing for the fact, though, that I have stayed in the House of Commons. I'm glad I did. I, I can speak there, holding no position in any party, excepting that I'm a member of the Conservative Party. I can speak there as you would speak if you were there, untrammeled, uncontrolled in any way, accepting my responsibilities. I'm getting on in years, they tell me. <laughs> I don't believe them. <laughs> I want to do what I can for whatever period lies ahead, to try, to continue to try, to make possible the dream of my boyhood. We came west when I was eight years of age, to Fort Carlton, very close to the area that, that the pres president lived in. The Red River carts were still moving. I saw the Indian and the Metis grossly and unfairly treated. I saw the beginnings of the mighty migration onto the prairies of Saskatchewan. That's before they started to migrate to BC. <laughs> I saw them treated in a manner that I regarded as discrimination. And I determined that I would devote my life to ending in my country a discrimination on the basis of race or color or any other reason. People said it, it was a, a dream. It could never be achieved. Here this evening, I know that you have representatives of various racial origins. When I was prime minister, we had the representatives of 13 different racial origins other than what are called the English and the French. Bringing together the composite capacity the attainments, the devotion of those who, not forgetting their homeland, have come here to Canada for freedom. That was not a popular stand to take. We had representatives of the Chinese race, Doug Jung, the Italian, German, Czechoslovak, Swedish, Norwegian, Belgian, and so on. <coughs> Differing racial origins, <coughs> but all dedicated in their love to Canada. And I've seen it here tonight. I've seen it. This afternoon, one of the most interesting things of all is to find these people from Saskatchewan who said, you remember me? I met you first in 1920. <laughs> one of them said that today. I said, I'll call you by name. He'll never get over it. <laughs> I only met him once. There they were today, the affection poured out to me, 
is beyond anything that I can ever adequately repay by words. There's one lady in this audience, Mrs. Deb Finley. On in years, she knew me in those days. Trying to build the Canada of your dreams and my dreams. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't like repetitions, but I'm tremendously impressed with the young men and women of today. They write me about everything. They ask me all kinds of questions. But there was one from Burnaby that stood in a class by himself. He wrote me, he said, I heard you on the TV saying that, that you uh, had letters from boys and girls, and then when they asked you, what did they ask about? I said, everything. Well, what is the major subject? Well, I said, about 10% want to know how to become prime minister. I might tell them how to become. But I also have to tell them that an end comes to it, too. But I don't tell that part. This fellow said, I don't want to be prime minister. I have enough trouble at home now the way it is. <laughs> what I want to know is, does a man of nine have to allow his 11-year-old sister to push him around? <laughs> the indignation in that letter. Now, what would you answer? I wasn't discreet. I said, just a little out of my depth. I suggest that you get in touch with Women's Lib in Vancouver. <laughs> Wonderful their attitude, their devotion to Canada, their idealism, far beyond that of my generation. That is my hope for the Canada that lies ahead. Not the 5% of what I call hell raisers. For them, I have no use, whatever. But the others, with their ideas, whether you accept them or not, nonetheless representative of the results of their thinking. And you'll be amazed the benefits that can come from hearing what they want. And there's the hope of the Canada of the future. No matter how discouraged I may become from time to time by developments, those young people are to me the overwhelming percentage possessed of an intelligence, a capacity, and above all, a desire to serve Canada and to bring about that union within this nation that's so sorely needed today. Because I would be less than frank if I didn't tell you that I have never seen my country divided as it is now. Never. People write me. They're full of fear. They're full of frustration. They wonder where we're going. Go Vatus. Just recall this, that wherever in the world dictatorship finally came about, Unless brought about by force, it's been the consequence of things that have been unjust, that have remained so. And finally, people come to the conclusion that anything could be better than what we have. That's the basis of dictatorship. And uh, I want to see that Canada of my dreams. I won't be here, but I still see the horizons of Canada's greatness, the potentialities far beyond anything that most people have yet realized and appreciated. I want to see that spirit engendered in the hearts of people that we will bring about within this nation 
a determination on the part of all people, whatever their racial origin may be, to contribute to that Zion, that city, that nation, in which the principles of justice will be paramount and which each and all will not judge anyone on the basis of racial origin, but rather on the way in which that person carries out the tremendous challenges of today. Now, I'm not going to say anything more. It's a very simple message. If I were to make a political speech, uh, I would speak longer. <laughs> it would take longer to recite some of the things that I might deal with. But being in a totally magnanimous state of mind, unaccustomed as I am, I, I'm going to refrain from doing so. I've known the leaders of the Western world and all of them. I've known the leaders of the Eastern world. Narrow an amazing personality. He never had a guard. I was with him in Delhi when there were 500,000 people there. He took me downtown. There was a fair on. He said, I never speak to audiences unless they're a half a million. I said, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> he had no guard. I never had a guard, and I wouldn't have one today. Recently, I was speaking in Montreal, and I said I never had a guard. I'm not speaking around the home, 24 Sussex Street, but I'm speaking about going about as you and I go about. I said I never had a guard, and then from way over there in the back, somebody, high voice, he said, that's not true. I said, it is true. If I'd have cut him down, I wouldn't have got the next sentence. He said, that's not true. 21 million Canadians guarded you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, nothing. Nothing. Could it please me more than that? That if you and I Joined together in cooperation, we can achieve the impossible. And that's what Canada needs today. Canada needs a message to every part of this nation. To French Canada and English Canada, a tremendous number of votes were cast when I was leader of this party in Quebec. Was it cast because, were they cast because I said you're wonderful people? Not at all. I pointed out to them that when they condemn the monarchy, they don't realize that it had, had it not been for a British king and a British parliament, the rights that they enjoy would never have come into fruition. That they would be in the they would be in the position. They would be in the position of the French Canadians in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and so on. If you talk to people with reason, they begin to see the effect. That's what's needed today. When I said I'm concerned about my country, I am. Not on a partisan basis, but my country above everything else. And if I leave nothing else with you, ladies and gentlemen, in this, each one of you, 
do something in your own area, in your own organization, in order to bring about that consensus across our Canada and all parts of Canada that will assure strength, stability, and above all, the greatness of our future. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you. I'll never be able to tell you what these two days have meant to me. Not unusual, I don't say that, because strangely enough, it's happening to me everywhere across the country. But there's been something about the last couple of days that will always be in my heart and my memory. God bless you all. Would you like to have to speak after him in the House of Commons? <laughs> Mr. Diefenbaker, this is the second most thrilling day in my life. The first one was shortly after October 72 when I was elected, and my secretary told me that Mr. Diefenbaker would be speaking in the House of Commons. And I had told her when I first got down there that I wanted to be informed because one of the things that I was so thrilled about when winning was that I would get to see this great Canadian in operation in our House of Commons, operating on Trudeau, as he says sometimes, without anesthetic. <laughs> the speech he gave was tremendous. He had the Liberals yelling and screaming at him. And from the back rows, there was a, an honorable member called Barney Danson, who happens to be in our city these fair days. He wasn't a minister at that time, who was doing his dutiful job yelling across the floor. And Mr. Diefenbaker stopped. He looked at the member. He looked at the speaker. And he said, Mr. Speaker, I see the honorable member over there. And when he came to this house, I used to think he was a real wit. But I've come to learn over the years that I was only half right. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, we want to thank you for being in Delta and White Rock in the past three days. I have spent those three days with Mr. Diefenbaker, staying in the Vancouver Hotel and in this hotel. And for that, I must also thank my wife because she hasn't seen me for three days. <laughs> but how many people in their lifetime would get the opportunity of spending three days having breakfast, lunch, and dinner with such a great Canadian? And I will never forget it, sir. It's been one of the highlights of my life. We've enjoyed your speech tonight. I know the people here have been thrilled with it. We would like you to take back to your wife, Mrs. Diefenbaker, our prayers and our love tonight. We know that we've kept you here a little longer than we should have, and she'll be waiting for your arrival. So I won't say any more than thank you. We've been privileged. <laughs>